Good evening, dear colleagues. It's a great pleasure for me to discuss a few facts on bioactive coatings in our advanced implant coating session. Bioactive coatings are used for a number of purposes, but the probably most important one is the enhancement of tissue integration of biomaterials. For dental implants, a number of approaches have been used to enhance osseointegration, like the development of micro rupt surfaces in the early 90s, like the use of physical chemical modifications to integrate fluoride ions into the titanium surface in the early 2000s, as well as the incorporation of nanocrystals of calcium phosphate. All these surface modifications have been able to improve osseointegration by the enhancement of osseoconduction. That means that the surface is not osteogenic as such, but it has to use what the tissue is able to provide. That may work in healthy patients, but there may be patients whose biology is, un is incapable of accomplishing this degree of osteointegration. And for these people, for these cases, we need bioactive molecules. So that means that we have to use organic coatings. Organic coatings that use adhesion molecules that foster the on-growth or in-growth of tissue into biomaterials, or use growth factors that enhance and foster tissue proliferation and differentiation, thereby directly activating bone formation. Well, I have been involved in this kind of research for almost 20 years, so this lecture will be kind of a personal journey through the research endeavors that we did and also, in a way, reflect what has been done over the last 20 years. So let's focus on growth factors, these little signals that orchestrate and accomplish tissue regeneration. Well, for bone regeneration, growth, there are a number of growth factors that are involved, namely bone morphogenic proteins, vascular and ethereal growth factor, platelet-derived growth factor, transforming growth factor beta, and basic fibroblast growth factor. You see them here. All of them are involved in bone regeneration, but the most prominent one probably are the family of bone morphogenic proteins because they are directly osteogenic. The problem of using growth factors on bioactive coatings is that we want to have these delicately three-dimensional molecules attached to the surface of the implant and to come off in a, art, in a kind of controlled release. This is not easy to accomplish and the most easy way probably to coat implants with these kind of growth factors is to directly load them onto the implant surface because this molecule here has a number of positive charges that readily adsorbs to the constitutionally negative charged implant surface. So when we dip an implant into a growth factor solution, it'll come like that, so the growth factor will become adsorbed to the surface and the surface will be covered with this growth factor. While it is easy to adsorb growth factor to the, to the implant surface, the, the downside is that once we place this implant into the body, it becomes very rapidly desorbed, so the biological activity of this implant surface decreases rapidly within the first hours. That means that we would have to increase the dosage to an unphysiological level which comes along or goes along with unfavorable events like osteolysis, tissue swelling, implant loosening as it has been shown here in this uh, publication of Lenkes and co-workers a couple of years ago. Adsorption is probably not the way to go and one of the possible avenues to use is to use extracellular matrix because extracellular matrix is the environment where Growth factors usually are found in the living body. Well, extracellular matrix is composed of proteins, is composed of glucose aminoglycans, and is composed of glucoproteins. We use this approach in a kind of self-assembly process. We did that together with the uh, Max Bergner Center in Dresden. We used collagen as the protein component. We used uh, chondroitin sulfate as gluc glucose aminoglycan component, and we used BMP as glycoprotein component. And we wanted to have it in a self-assembly process. That's what we call a biomimetic self-assembly coating. And that's easy or quite easy to accomplish because collagen, again, is a, is a weakly cationic molecule that nicely adsorbs to the titanium surface. The chondrian sulfate is, is associated to that, and finally the BMP is added. The thickness of this coating, as you can see here in a, a laser scanning electron microscopic picture, is 50 micrometers, which is quite thick for an implant coating. When you look at the scanning electron microscope pictures, you see a densely covered surface with collagen fibers, which, is, which gives you the impression that this is actually extracellular matrix and not a metal surface anymore. So something that should look like appetizing for the bone tissue to grow onto it. 
we also wanted to the, the BMP to become released in a more retarded fashion. And if you look at the release curves that we've uh, shown here, you can see that there's almost a 48 hour re retarded release function of this exocellular matrix coating. Well, we then went into a preclinical trial and we used the dog model and we used uh, screw implants with excavations to allow for bone ingrowth and the elevation, uh, evaluation of the bone formation. And when we did that, we could see when we, paired, we compared titanium machine surfaces, collagen surfaces, and the BMP surface, we could see that machine titanium and collagen were significantly different with a lower, significantly lower values in, in the machine titanium surface. But the BMP surface has not been able to additionally add something to the bone implant contact and also the bone volume density. So the reason for this may be that the amount of BMP that is spontaneously absorbed to this exocellular matrix coating is probably too low and the, num uh, the amount of BMP release is as well too low and you may remember that there were only four to five nanograms that were released from the surface. Well, while it is easy to surpass a machined titanium surface, the advent of these micro rough surfaces, of course, is a much bigger challenge. So we redid the experiment a couple of years later where we compared machine surfaces and dual acid edged micro rough surfaces in combination with the exocellular matrix coating with and without BMP. And when we looked at the bone implant contact after four weeks and after 12 weeks, we saw that once again the machine surface had the significantly lowest values but the micro rough surfaces and the collagen coated or micro coated surfaces and the BMP coated surfaces were not significantly better. So obviously it is not enough to have this exocellular matrix coating and the, the addition of small amounts of BMP to really surpass what we have today, the micro rough surfaces in the clinical use. So obviously the use of the exocellular matrix spontaneous coating in conjunction with BMP has not been enough to surpass the current standard of clinical care that is, that is the micro rough surface. So the strategy of this biomimetic self-assembly obviously was nothing that was leading forward and we had to change the strategy and we decided to directly target the bioactive uh, molecules and bind them to the surface for a control binding and release. And for that we had to use anchoring molecules, anchoring molecules that form a monolayer on the surface that can then bind these bioactive molecules. Well, anchoring molecules in those days were like, for instance, phosphonic acid molecules, anchoring molecules that through a chemical modification process were able to covalently bind these growth factors to the, uh, to the implant surface, thereby immobilizing them, but with very little release. So this was not the strategy we wanted to go because we wanted to have it as a, a, a to be able to release these growth factors from the surface. So we went down another avenue and again we did that together with the Max Bergman Centrum in Dresden with a group of Dieter Schoenweber. We used oligonucleotide strands. Oligonucleotide strands can be fixed to the implant surface. And the tricky thing is they provide a code. So if we add growth factor that is conjugated to the complementary sequence of oligonucleotides, we can quite specifically bind them to the implant surface. And while this binding becomes loosened and released spontaneously over time, we provide a kind of controlled release, so to say. And the advantage of this additionally is that we can change the code of this binding or anchoring molecules. If we add a second code, like by modification of these oligonucleotide strains, like you see it here, then we can add also a second type of growth factor, like BMPs, for instance, and VEGF, a vascular endothelial growth factor, and then specifically bind these molecules to the surface. And then finally, if we add or incorporate um, mismatches, then we will loosen this binding even more, and then we can create different patterns of release, so that, for instance, VEGF is released at first, and then followed by BMP, which is something that we would ex expect for the wound healing next to an implant. Well, when we used that in an in vitro environment and had an in vitro evaluation, you could see that the BMP 
and the VEGF controlled release was definitely somewhat different. And you can also see, you see the curves below, that the nano-anchored growth factors had a significant retarding effect and also had a significant binding on the surface. We went into a preclinical experiment and we used specifically fabricated screw implants with nano-rub surfaces and with little burr holes in the neck and in the tip of the implant, they would allow for bone engulfs, thereby allowing to evaluate the, uh, the bone formation activity next to the implant. Well, these were inserted into the tibia of, of rats so that the both cortical and cancellous bone were engaged. And the histologic specimens showed that with the adsorbed BMP, there was some kind of bone formation on the surface, while with the nano-anchored, specifically bound BMP, we had a continuous layer of, of bone on the surface, although this was very thin. When we looked at the VEGF-coated implants, we could see that we had a number of or significantly increased vessels in the vicinity of the implant surface. You see that in the little asterisks here, compared to the only adsorbed growth factor. So there was a appreciable effect of this kind of binding and release of growth factors on the implant surface. So when we looked at the bone implant contact, which is still the gold standard for the invention of osseointegration, we could see after one, four, and 13 weeks different effects. We could see that the specifically anchored BMPs had accomplished a significant increase in bone implant contact after one week and after four weeks, but after 13 weeks, there was no significant difference anymore. And if we looked at the VEGF coated implant surfaces, we could see that after four weeks, we had a significantly increased bone implant contact. But looking at the small animal models and looking at the rather minor effects in terms of bone implant contact, it may appear that this will probably disappear or that we may not be able to really move forward in a clinical scenario. So what is the reason for that? What is the reason for these minor effects? And one, one reason could be that mono uh, layer coatings of implant surfaces do only accomplish or accommodate very low amounts of growth factor, like in the nanogram range. You can see that here in this graph that polydopamine, chitosan, hyaluronic acid, or the oligonucleotides that we used had only on average 200 nanograms, which is quite little. And maybe the problem is that the surface simply is not big enough to accommodate these kinds of amounts that we need. So the consequent movement would be to go from monolayer layer coating again to multi-layer coating, going back, so to say, into a three-dimensional coating structure. This multi-layer approach will be different from what we used to do 20 years ago when we did that, uh, that spontaneous or self-assembly coating of extracellular matrix, because this will be in a much more organized and engineered fashion. We will use polyelectrolyte multi-layers, which are uh, negatively and positively charged long molecules like the polycations, like polyelusine, which will nicely uh, lay on the negatively charged surface of the implant. And that can be nicely combined with polyanions like hyaluronic acid, heparin, and chondroitin sulfate, negatively charged uh, acidic polysaccharides. And you, kn you know that these three are components of the extracellular matrix. So we're getting back, in a, in a way, into the extracellular matrix coating, but do it, as I said, in a much more engineered way. So we, were, we used the polyelosine heparin system, and we did that with a group of Klaus Liefeit with the Institute for Bioanalytics and Measurement Technique in, in Heiligenstadt. We used this polyelosine to cover the surface as a positively charged molecule. Then we added heparin as the negative charge molecule, and we then went on using these pairs of positive and negatively charged molecules to build up a three-dimensional layer. And we used that 10 times, and you see that with every step we use, the thickness layer grew. But as you can see here, it didn't grow that much as we had 20 years ago in 50 microns. It just was 50 nanometers, which is a very, very thin layer. And the good thing is that this one is, is completely controlled in the way it is constructed. And we can then uh, look at the surface, and the surface is very smooth and very thin and is ready to accommodate um, growth factors as, uh, to, for the implant coating. And we did that. We added BMP 
And the interesting thing is that the amount of BMP that we could add to this surface, depending on the concentration in the loading solution, was one to two time, times or as higher than we were able in this monolayer coatings. And the interesting thing is that the release of these BMPs or these growth factor molecules from these constructed layers was much more like a retarded or controlled release device. You can see that here over 21 days, slowly releasing 60% of the biological activity. And the next thing is that we can as well use more than one growth factor by uh, dividing them in layers by using linkers that in between divide these, uh, these uh, thicker layers of coating. So we started with uh, a few layers of, uh, of this polyelectrolyte multilayer coating. We added BMP and then sealed this one off with the linkers. We added the next layer. We added vesicle and the growth factor, sealed that with the linker and then added a final layer and again added BMP or you could even add a third growth factor if you want, if you feel that this patient is in need of that one. And then the release will be entirely engineered and organized in a way that we then, if you look at the release and you see the different conditions on the surface, we can actually control the release dynamics of these growth factors. So we have a tunable system that will be able to release biologically active molecules just as the patient would need. And this could uh, also contribute to kind of individualized implant treatment. Well, is this all clinically feasible? How, what happens if you have a screw implant and you, you insert it into the bone? Doesn't it come off with the friction uh, with the, between the surface and the bone? Well, the guys in, in, uh, in Heiligenstadt did experiments to look at the stability under clinical conditions. They used, of course, plastic jaws. They used insertion torques of between 15 and 35 nanocentimeters, uh, uh, Newton centimeters, sorry. And they covered the surface with a layer that was fluorescence marked. And when they looked onto the surface after the insertion, you can see that this whole surface is still covered with this coating. There are only a few areas on the, on the uh, cutting edges of the threads that may uh, have lost the, the coating, but the rest is still maintained. So uh, we are currently in the evaluation of, uh, of in vivo results, but this could be an option for a bioactive coating that could uh, be uh, much better in the performance than all the ones we have tried before. So in conclusion, just let me come to, to the, the very, the most important messages. The adsorption of bioactive molecules on the surface has shown to be impractical because you have to have these huge dosages of growth factors that, that potentially are harmful. The biomimetic extracellular matrix assembly is obviously not able to accommodate enough amounts of growth factor to be able to be really biologically active in an in vivo environment. The binding and release of growth factors using these monolayer coatings is a, an approach that may work, but most likely will as well not be able to accommodate enough growth factor to be biologically effective. So the multilayer coating on implants is probably the one that allows for a stepwise integration of growth factors and also a very, uh, very sophisticated differential release of growth factors to be able to foster and to enhance the biological reaction of the peri-implant tissues. Finally, I would like to give credit to those guys we are working with in all these research endeavors. That's the Max Bachmann Center, uh, Center in Dresden and the Institute for Bio, uh, Bioanalytics at Measurement Technique in Ilmenau, and of course, those guys that gave all the money to perform this kind of research. And finally, I would like to thank you for your kind attention.